Thank you, everybody, for being here. Steve, thank you for being thank here. Thank you for being here. We've been together a lot today. We started the morning early yeah, on Squawk Box. This it, early morning gig on Squawk Box. You came on trying to film it yourself with your I, I did your I phone did. on Facebook. Turn the tables. You know we're on. We're we're not just live here, but we're also live on the internet. How about that? It's an internet. amazing I've thing. I've heard that. I think it's got real potential. Um, we are here in part or in large part because um, you have a new book out. Congratulations on the book. The book is called The Third Wave. And one of the things that's so interesting when I think about you is that I think of you, I was talking to you uh, backstage, sort of about the portfolio life that you live in the three different things that you do, policy, business, philanthropy. But the third wave that you're talking about here is not that. Right. And so to the extent that you can, just to sort of set the table for people here, tell everybody here what the third wave is. Sure. Uh, first of all, I should start out by acknowledging that the inspiration for the concept of the third wave and the title of the third wave uh, is a futurist, Alvin Toffler. He wrote a book called The Third Wave uh, that came out in 1980 when I was a senior in college. And I remember reading it and I was completely captivated by it. it, it, uh, it I just, he was talking about this electronic cottage and getting information in new ways and so forth. And even though in 1980, Essentially, nobody was connected. Most people, well, no, virtually nobody had personal computers. Uh, I knew he was right, and so that was, you know, that for the last nearly four decades, I've been pursuing that path, uh, inspired really by by reading that that book. So when I decided to finally write a book, this first book uh, I've written, I wanted to start it off by acknowledging the role he played, uh, and I borrowed that title. Thankfully, he you know, was okay with it and wrote a nice blurb for it, and, and uh, appreciate that. Uh, but my three waves are different. His waves were basically there was a agricultural revolution and then an industrial revolution and then a technology revolution in essence. You know, my view of this in terms of the last you know, couple of, of uh, waves, the first in the internet was just building the internet. The second was building on top of the internet. And the third is integrating the internet in other aspects of our lives. We've been through two waves and we're about to break, you know, see, the, see the third one uh, emerged. The first companies like AOL were part of it. You heard this in the uh, introduction when we started in 1985, 31 years ago. Only 3% of people were online. Uh, and so getting America online, getting people to see the value of getting online, building the software, the networks, the servers, not just AOL, but obviously many companies, you know, Cisco and Microsoft and IBM and a lot, Sun Microsystems, a lot of people were part of that, that first wave, really building the internet and building on ramps to the internet and educating people about the internet. And then that led to the you know, the second wave kind of started around 2000 and, and up until now, which has been building apps and services on top of the internet. And everybody knows some of the iconic brands that have emerged, Facebook and Twitter and, and, and Snapchat and Waze and so forth, which are basically software, basically apps. And the successful ones were well designed and, and were able to reach a broad audience through kind of viral kind of marketing and, and people sharing it with, with, with other their friends. Uh, and those opportunities will continue, but this, in this third wave, it's going to be more about how do you take technology, particularly the internet, and use it to really reimagine education and healthcare and energy and transportation uh, and a lot of financial services uh, and even things like the food, uh, food industry, uh, which will require a different mindset, I think a different playbook than the second wave did, which is why I decided to write a book kind of outlining my view of what's going to happen and why it's something that, that, you know, that, that you know, I think people should be thinking about and how they can position themselves to potentially benefit from that uh, as opposed to you know, possibly right. left behind. Okay, so if the first wave is, a, and, and we first wave, if, you, if the first wave is companies like, as you said, AOL, Cisco, Apple, IBM, and the second wave, I think you'll put these guys on the list, Amazon, Waze, Facebook, Snapchat, the like. The third wave, do the companies exist already? Are they new companies? Are they big conglomerates that already exist that are gonna somehow revolution, revolutionize themselves? Who are these? The answer is, don't know. Uh, and, I, and, and I think nobody knows. And it kind of depends on how some of the large companies that are incumbents and have certain you know, advantages, how they play this. 
Uh, do they kind of lean into the future and, and, and invest in, in, in new ideas and, and experiment and take some of the risks associated with that? Uh, or do they kind of play defense and try to protect what they've, they've got? And particularly, do they partner with some of the innovators outside their company and or the entrepreneurs? The ones that do that, I think, will be well positioned. The ones that don't will be, right. will, be, will be left behind. And similarly, entrepreneurs will need to kind of increasingly partner with these larger companies. But if you look at that, the list you just mentioned, uh, a company like Facebook at the beginning of the second wave didn't even exist. Like Mark Zuckerberg was, you know, maybe in high school then, if, you know, maybe perhaps even middle school. You know, Snapchat didn't exist, Waze didn't exist. So a lot of these these brands that emerged emerged doing that, and that will happen again. So the the winners in the third wave, right. if we have this discussion, call it 15 years from now, uh, will likely be you know some companies that were able to transform themselves to be you know to be leaders in this in this new wave and 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 some new ones for sure and all related i mean we keep talking about new industries that you can actually touch and feel but still information services related meaning still internet related and the reason i say that is because you look at all of the innovation that's happened over the past 20 30 40 years it really has been about information services the idea that we can now have all the stuff in our in our, i don't have my phone on me because they told me to turn it off um, all, all on this one little device, but you still have to toast uh, your toast in the morning in a big toaster, meaning the, the, the technology in so many other parts of our life has not kept up with this piece of it. Uh, correct, and, 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 and toaster, you know, I guess, works pretty well, but there are a lot of aspects of our lives, including when we get sick and go to the doctor or get really sick and go to the hospital or when our kids go to you know, fourth grade or you know, you know, whether, when people go to the you know, university. It actually hasn't changed that much. You know, a little bit of technology, a little bit of innovation, not that much, and is gonna change, I think, I think needs to change. I would say it's a little broader than information services. It's really about uh, technology, including but not limited to the internet, as this kind of engine of innovation and, and kind of new possibilities. Uh, and I think in, in, as this third wave uh, develops, even the notion of it being information or technology or even the internet will fade away. And, and the, you know, the, the, as technology really become mainstreamed and really become a part of everyday life, they start getting taken for granted. So electricity, for example, is not taken for granted in some parts of the world, but it is taken for granted in most parts of the, uh, the developed world, certainly in the United States. Uh, and people don't say, oh, that's a, electricity enabled you know, company, it's just, it's just electricity. Uh, and so this notion of internet enabled companies I think will fade, even some of the hyphenated uh, notion of the internet like e-commerce or email. I've always said that you know it's really arrived when it, you can drop the hyphen. Right. It is mail, it is commerce, it's just so fundamental uh, that it's no longer kind of this, this kind of you know, interesting right. you know, new thing that's developing. So we're still a ways away from that. It's amazing what we've seen happen in, in the last 30 years. There's still a lot of uh, uh, things that need to happen to get to that point, but I think more of that will happen in this, uh, this next wave. And even the notion of technology. When I got started, technology was a sector, a tech sector. Every company is now a technology company, and some of the most significant you know, companies in other sectors, like a Walmart, for example, is a huge user of, of technology. Uh, and so technology is becoming much more fundamental and less something right. that's a, a discrete set of, of, of capabilities or even a discrete set of businesses. So I want to drill down to maybe some of the sectors that we think are actually going to change and how they may change. But to me, one of the overarching major shifts we're already beginning to see, and I know you have investments in a number of these companies, is employment. Right. And just the shift that all of this is going to take for us, all of us. Um, I came here in an Uber today. That's part of the gig, gig economy. You own a company called Handy, uh, which will send people to go clean your, clean your home. Yeah. How is the gig economy a good thing? It's a good thing, and the gig economy is one term, another, another term that I think maybe a better one in the long run is sort of the flexible economy, that because it gives people flexibility on both sides. On the, on the consumer side, it becomes easier, like you're used to with an Uber, if you want your apartment clean tomorrow at three o'clock uh, for an hour or two hours, depending on what you want to do, and this or that you know, extra feature, and you can do it on your phone and have it instantly confirmed. Uh, and have the people you know, vetted. And if you want the same person to come back, you can request that, that same person. It's more convenient, it's more affordable. Uh, for the, the person actually doing the cleaning, it gives them enormous flexibility because instead of just being, you know, working for something and saying you gotta be there at seven o'clock and you, know, you can't leave till whatever, you know, six o'clock, uh, and, and you have really no control of their, 
life. They're just kind of doing what they're told and have to be in this place then and that place. You know, and people have more flexibility. They want to, you know, in, in a morning, maybe because there's like a teacher conference, you know, kind of not work then and start working at 11. They, they just don't accept right. jobs and the gigs for that, that morning. Oh. And, and they also, because they're, they're you know, we're kind of eliminating a, uh, middleman it's, it is more affordable uh, I mean more affordable for the consumer and generally the people doing the work not just in the case of handy but are getting paid more than they would have if they worked for a company that was basically you know, that 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 intermediary so it does create additional flexibility does create additional uh, convenience there are some risks to it and I think one of the things I talk about in the book is as this becomes more important right now 34 percent of, of, of people in this country are part of the freelance contractor world and the this this in increasing kind of you know gig economy, flexible economy, number of workers is now millions. Didn't exist really five years ago, uh, and that will grow. And so as that grows, how do we think of work? How do how do we even classify work? On you know Squawk Box every month, you say, oh here's the, the job numbers right. are coming from the labor department. Say, oh what are the job numbers? But the job numbers don't really track this phenomenon we're talking about. So how do we think about this? And should these people also get some kind of be set of benefits, health benefits or other kinds? Well, of things, and that but that ultimately becomes the question right with the flexibility you actually lose security right if you have to if, if, if your child's sick and you can't work that day you also don't get paid that day you, and you, so when you hear people like Hillary Clinton come out and say if she becomes the president she wants to look very seriously at the uber model if you will and try to perhaps put policies around on, around it that might make these businesses uh, much tougher and much more challenging to be successful in part because not only are we paying the reason they're so successful is we're willing to do it because we, we pay less. But ultimately, what happens well, if we're paying more? Well, I think it, it makes... On the consumer I, end. I, first of all, I think she or anybody who's next president should look at this. One of the arguments I make in, in, in the book is that this next wave is going to require more dialogue, more discussion between the innovators and the policymakers because it is changing the definition of work. It is changing how we think about health. It is changing how we think about learning. It is changing how we think about food. Those are regulated businesses. They'll continue to be regulated. We can argue over good regulations or bad regulations, but there are going to be regulations about food safety. There are going to be regulations about drug safety. There are going to be regulations about claims on medical devices. There are going to be regulations in these, and even around drone technology, things like that, because even though there are a lot of benefits to it, there are some risks in terms of privacy or risk if one of the drone kind of crashes into your kid's playground and hurts somebody, there's, there's, there's going to be regulations. And, and the, it wasn't really the case in the second wave. If you, if, you, if you created Instagram, there wasn't like, oh, what, what's the regulation around Instagram? When they get really big, then there's some issues around privacy usually that emerge, but it wasn't front and center. It's going to be front and center in this third wave. So as you think about these new things, how do you enable the innovation to happen, but figure out in the right time, in the right way, hopefully in a constructive kind of way with the, the, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, and the policymakers having that dialogue, and hopefully the policymakers actually having a functional government where, right. where they actually can figure out how to get stuff, you know, stuff done, that's going to become you know, more important. So exactly how this, this whole flexible economy plays out, exactly what the rules are, don't know, right. uh, but I do know it's going to become more important to figure out. But on your issue of, of health, even now, because of the rules around the Affordable Care Act and the fact that certain people are covered if they have more than a certain number of hours per week, but not if they have less than a certain number of hours a week, that has changed the behavior of some employers and some workers. Right. And so these things do matter. Policy does matter. And the next wave of innovation and technology, that's going to become you know, more important. Okay, so let me make it more complicated. I know you said this is it's going to be complicated and we need to find the right policy and have that conversation. Uh, let's say the next president is um, voted on, whoever that is, and they are preparing to come into office in late November, early December. They call you up. They say, Steve, I need you to come visit with me and I need you to tell me what I should be doing on these things. Not that we should have the conversation about these issues, but what should my policy prescription be? You would tell the president what? Well, first of all, I would, I would hope that the next president will have read this book because there's a whole chapter on <laughs> what the government should do and how there's a risk of America itself being disrupted and how they need to think about government in a different way and more of this kind of constructive you know, dialogue. And at this point, there are not that many candidates, so I'll, I'll make sure each of them gets a, a free book, just to make a little contribution to the, the discussion. Uh, and in answer to your specific question, I do not know. 
And I think you need to get people in the room who understand the different dynamics and have a discussion and put some facts on the table and you know, get some opinions on the table and based on that figure out what is the, the right kind of common ground that, that, that moves forward. I would not be surprised, I would be surprised if anybody put policies in place that would essentially slow or, or, or significantly impact the growth of this flexible economy because of the general view I think would be it's good for the economy, it's good for people in the economy, whether it be the, the consumers of that product or service or the workers of that product or service. But there would be a discussion about at what point do you have extra uh, kind of uh, or certain benefits. There are some discussions. There's even Congress, there's some uh, legislation that's being considered that maybe every time you take an Uber ride, there's a, you know, some, you know, some charge that goes on top of that that goes into like a health care fund or something. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But I do know that you need to have more of these discussions, more of this constructive dialogue as we move from a world of apps right. and software and social media, uh, all of which has been great, I, I, and to a world where you're really impacting significant aspects of people's lives. There's significant regulatory issues associated with those and significant policy, kind of what's right for you know, the, you know, the country at large or communities at large kinds of issues. So it's gonna be a tougher right. wave. Let me make it even tougher. Oh. So don't you want us to make it easier? Are when you, you, are you looking when, for complexity? When you think about employment, no, but this is actually, to me, the, the great challenge on the employment issue. And maybe it's the third wave. Maybe it's ultimately the fourth wave by the time you get That's to the this. the next book. Let's sell this one first. Um, <laughs> which is to say that you, know, you have companies like Uber today, which from a policy perspective, they go around the world and they tell all the regulators, you know, we are creating new jobs. We're creating flexibility. We're creating all sorts of opportunity. Meanwhile. They have a huge investment right outside of Carnegie Mellon in autonomous vehicles. Right. In 10 years from now, the argument that they've made around the world and to all of these drivers, come work for us, we're gonna create great opportunity for you, is gonna be flipped on its head because the cars are gonna drive themselves and all of those people won't have jobs, I don't think. As you look past perhaps the third wave and you look at whether we all turn into a leisure class or I don't know what, uh, but the idea that robots and AI and all of this technology may ultimately undo most, if not many, of our jobs. Is there an inevitability to that? And then what do we do? I think there is an inevitability to some of that. Uh, and I think anybody who says there's not a risk of, as we, because we've seen this march of, of, of productivity gains and other things that basically have, you know, kind of taken a lot of jobs, manufacturing jobs, and, and, and more recently, kind of out of the system. And there's a middle class that has been hollowed out, which is part of the reason why a lot of people are really frustrated and feeling left out and angry. And you're seeing that kind of play out in this, in this uh, election cycle. Will there be more of that? Yes. Uh, hopefully, and I believe, because I'm an optimist on this, there also will be kind of countervailing benefits with some of these new products and services, some of these new companies that, that emerge. It's worth remembering 100 years ago, essentially everybody, I think the number was like 96%, uh, of, of, of people in this country were working on farms. They were in the agriculture sector. And when, when the automation started happening in agriculture, now it's 2%. So it went from essentially everybody to essentially nobody. Uh, but people then found other jobs in other industries, including some that were not imagined. Your business now of television. You know, nobody thought that 100 years ago when they're saying, oh my goodness, the, you know, what's gonna happen to farming? Because we're all farmers and feels like this new technology, the tractor or the, you know, whatever is gonna kind of eliminate some of those jobs. So the challenge is you can't slow that pace of innovation that's gonna you know, create some, you know, some decline in some jobs that had existed before. Hopefully, as a society, we're able to create some new opportunities, invent some new stuff. Uh, that so does you're not, you're not fatalistic about it. I'm not fatalistic about it. I, I think uh, most of these things, I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. I think there are techno optimists that believe technology solves all problems, uh, and there are also the fatalists who believe the world's coming to an end. And, and the, I don't believe either of those is, is, a, is a, a view that I share. I think the answer is somewhere in the middle, and you're gonna get to that middle ground answer by thinking about this in a constructive way and having a dialogue between various folks that need to be part of that dialogue and figuring out what the, the path forward is. I do think, in, in the, the other thing that I would, I would say to the next president, uh, is while there are specific issues to focus on, as a you know, flexible economy issue or other, other privacy issues and other things, uh, the bigger picture 
is how do we remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world, which is not guaranteed. And it's, it's worth remembering that 250 years ago, America itself was an idea. It, it, we had nothing. Now it's the leader of the free world because it has a leading economy. Because, as Toffler talked about, we were the leader in the agricultural revolution, leader in the industrial revolution, leader in the technology revolution. Other countries, as you know, have figured out that the secret sauce that sort of animated the American story is this pioneering, innovative, entrepreneurial spirit. And they're saying, we want more of that stuff. So they are investing more in basic research. They're figuring out the right regulatory environment. They're putting immigration policies in place to attract talent to their, 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 uh, their, their countries. They're doing all, putting investment incentives to drive more capital to the, you know, the companies in their, in their country. So we're now in, we've seen in the last half century, as you've covered, the globalization of capital. We've seen the globalization of manufacturing. We're now seeing the globalization of entrepreneurship. And so the number one thing I would say is what do we do to make sure we remain the most innovative entrepreneurial you know, country? And if we do that, there's a, I think we'll be well positioned in this third wave. If not, we're going to, not just about losing some jobs right. because of AI or, or robotics, actually about losing whole sectors and potentially losing our way as the, this pioneering uh, nation. So the question, and, and in part because you can sense it, in the country today, given the politics of the moment and how polarized people are and how angry they are, that we're now having conversations about how globalization, which um, seemed like such a great thing, may not be such a great thing uh, after all. There's conversations about building walls. There's conversations right. about tariffs. Uh, just yesterday, uh, to some extent, we built our own little mini wall um, through tax policy, um, where we are preventing, uh, I would argue properly, other people have a very different view of this, uh, American companies uh, from buying these foreign companies through these corporate inversions um, and then pretending that they're uh, based over there when they're really based here. But what is the answer? We, I mean, I, you keep saying we need an answer. I'm trying to understand what the answer is, though, that, that would make this such an attractive place to be. Make this country such yeah. an attractive it, It's building. And, 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 if, and if you believe that we're in such a global world, how we can ultimately be competitive when, frankly, um, we, we cost a lot more than everybody else, right? I mean, that's still a, still a major, major issue. The reason why so much of the business has left this country is because it's cheaper to do it elsewhere. That's obviously true in many sectors, uh, but this country has led the way in a lot of the great innovations. And I think it's, a, it's because of this creativity because of this uh, willingness to take risks. Not all, not all you know, countries have that kind of mentality. The right incentives to take, take those risks, the right infrastructure to support people who want to take those, those risks. And, and while it's not true across all the country, you know, there, there, there are many places, and there are more and more in, in, in what we call the rise of the rest regions, of these strong entrepreneurial regions developing. But it, and I go through it in, in detail in, in, the, in the book. I do think some of the things other countries are doing, we need to take a fresh look at. We've been cutting our investment in basic research. That's a problem. The inter internet only exists because our government funded it. We created it through DARPA. So that's number one. Number two is figuring out the right kind of regulatory policy. The internet only flourished because Congress decided to pass the Telecom Act to commercialize access to the internet. And a judge, Judge Green, decided to break up the phone company, Ma Bell, create a lot of regional companies and create thousands of telecom companies which went, took the cost of online services when we first started from $10 an hour to a penny an hour. And, and, and so how do you create the right kind of regulatory environment to allow these things to flourish? How do you create the right kind of invest, investment incentives around capital gains, others, so there's more risk capital going into these sectors, particularly the ones that have a longer cycle in terms of the of And the you don't think do tax policy, for example, it's just a race to the bottom? Race to the bottom in that you're always going to find another country, whether it, if Ireland's at 12.5%, Getting to 12.5% is very painful for us if that's the yeah, country you want to be competitive I, I, with. I don't, think, I don't think that's the mentality. I think the question is how do you have a, a policy, that, a tax policy that is reasonably consistent within the country and then reasonably competitive with other countries, but then win on the margin because of some of the things you're doing around 
innovation. The other thing that, that, we, that I think was a step forward with, with Congress, they passed a law a few years ago called the JOBS Act that legalized right. crowdfunding that makes it easier for people to raise capital. Making sure that works and isn't overly constrained by, by right regulations is important. Immigration, I know it's right. a sensitive issue. It's gotten particularly you know, kind of hot and contentious in this election cycle. We will not remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation if we don't continue to win what is now a global battle for talent. So we need to figure out a way, and I hear many stories, and they're tragic stories of people who've come to this country to get an education. One particular, somebody was at Wharton, started a company, basically couldn't extend his visa, got kicked out, went home to India, and that company snapped deal and has 5,000 employees and is worth, I think, $5 billion. He wanted to stay here. We kicked him out. Right. So we have to deal with that, that issue. So there's a bunch of things that if we don't get them right, then there is a real risk that we're going to lose our way, but I, I'm right. optimistic that, uh, that we will get them right. Exactly how, exactly when, what exactly is the construct, I, it's hard to, hard to see. Uh, but I think if, if hopefully once we get through this election cycle, there'll be more of the dialogue around those issues. And of course, there are many issues you have to deal with, but front and center is I think jobs and economy and innovation and entrepreneurship. And in the presidential debates, I haven't watched all of them, because there's been a lot of them on both sides, uh, but I, I think there's been six or 700 questions answered and less than 1% were on these issues about in innovation. Do you have a candidate? I'm sorry, I do, do not. Do you have a candidate? candidate? Who do you like? I, and I know it's, uh, you'll think I'm ducking the question. My, my strategy for the, you know, the, 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 the last more than decade is to not get involved in politics. I do not endorse candidates. I don't raise money for candidates. I, I'm focused more on policy. And where I think I can be helpful, hopefully I can be helpful, uh, is try to be somebody kind of quietly behind the scenes who's actually trying to build bridges between the sides to get, get but stuff on, done. So on, I, therefore, I, if I had a view on, on politics, I think it would undermine my ability to be uh, me, hopefully a bridge builder on policy. If we were just to, to think about the singular issue about entrepreneurship in the United States and innovation in the United States, is there a candidate that you think addresses that? I'm not that? going there. I'm not going there. Nice try, Mr. Sorkin. No, I'm not going to go there. Again, I, I respect people who are willing to throw their hat in the race. I, 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 think, I think it's been a an interesting year, that's for right. sure, and, and you know, it'll be, I think, interesting in the next uh, uh, next uh, you know few months. And it'll be interesting to see how this all you know, this all right. plays out. Uh, but I'm prepared to work with. I, I've lived in now D.C. for 30 years. I've worked with President Obama, worked with President Bush, worked with President Clinton. I'll work with President whatever that president is and do what I can. Right. Uh, to, again, just in a small way, just focused on these issues around innovation and entrepreneurship, to do what I can to try to build some bridges and, and try to you know, get some stuff done. Which raises a different question. You're a thoughtful guy. You live in D.C. Uh, you care about policy. Would you ever want to run for president? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because, I, again, first of all, the, the mere action of, of being involved in politics then undermines your ability to serve in this kind of bridge builder role, number one. And number two, I kind of like what I'm doing. I, mean, I have a great opportunity with Revolution, a great opportunity with the Case Foundation, a great opportunity on the, on the policy front. Um, and so I, I, think, I think staying on the sidelines out, and staying out of politics and trying to, you know, on some percentage of my time focus on policy, but most of my time try to identify and back and mentor the next generation of great entrepreneurs who can lead the way in the third wave. And with the foundation, my wife Jean is here, uh, runs. And we're very interested in leveling the playing field to make sure opportunity is available to, to all right now. The, the deck is stacked against a lot of entrepreneurs. 90% of venture capital goes to men, 10% to women. It uh, doesn't accurately reflect the distribution of, of great ideas. Overwhelmingly, people of color are, are not given the same opportunities. And people outside of New York City and Silicon Valley and Boston are not given the same opportunities. Last year, 75% of venture capital went to three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. So we're trying to level the playing field and, and create more opportunity. And the first wave, we, the work we did on AOL was about democratizing access to the internet, and access to information. Now we're trying to democratize access to opportunity and democratize access to the idea of entrepreneurship and giving people the tools to, if they have an idea, to, to right. take a shot at it. In the eighth chapter of your book, you talk about impact investing. Um, why don't we talk about what impact investing is? And if you could answer this, is, impacting, is impact investing real or is it a marketing gimmick? Uh, it's real. And, it, and it's, it's developing, particularly in the last two or three years, in a, in a really quite remarkable way. I, I understand there, there's skepticism, particularly a lot of folks uh, 
here in New York who are investors. They go, oh, I don't know what impact investing is. Uh, but the, let me frame it for people who don't uh, understand it. For, for pretty much the last half century, the general view of business, and Milton Friedman you know, was the one who kind of, you know, kind of famously framed this, is all you should focus on is maximizing profit, full stop. And if you're maximizing profit and returning as much profit, in either directly through dividends or indirectly through share appreciation to your shareholders, that is the role uh, and the only role of business. Uh, there is a view, which I share, that there, that's part of the, 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 the focus. Obviously, you need to have a successful, profitable company. But increasingly, you also need to think about purpose as well as profit and figure out how you're going to have a positive impact. And it goes back to some of the earlier questions. There's some companies, including some we've invested in, that are actually quite focused on job creation, not job destruction. That's one of the things they measure. There's others who are focused on kind of benefits to society. Maybe it's climate change or other kinds of things. And the reason it's catching on is there's a new generation of entrepreneurs who are inspired by that idea. There's a new generation of investors who want to back those ideas. And there's a new generation of customers and employees, particularly the millennials, who are insisting that the companies they work for or do business with stand for something more than profit. As a result, we've seen several things in the last uh, you know, few years where some of the largest financial institutions in the country, indeed in, in, in the world, you know, BlackRock, for example, Bain, tomorrow night I mentioned I'm going to be in Boston with Deval Patrick, the former governor of Massachusetts, and he at Bain is starting a Bain Impact Fund to focus on impact investing. There's been some rule changes, including in Washington, there's rules around FINRA and other kinds of things to basically allow pension funds and others to invest in this, in this space. So the momentum is building, and every entrepreneur has to figure out what their focus is and what their strategy is. But my belief and my expectation is, particularly in this third wave, you'll see the growth of more companies that, while of course they're going to focus on profit, they're also going to focus on purpose, and that is going to make a difference in terms of the, the people that want to work for and, 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 and do business with or invest in uh, and those companies. I want to take you back in time, if I could, to your time at AOL. You talk about this in Chapter 9. Mm -hmm. Selfishly, if you're a merger guy, which I, uh, that's where I started my career, I loved this because it really spoke to what happened to AOL and AOL and Time Warner and your feelings about it. What do you think would have happened to AOL if you didn't merge with Time Warner? Hard to say. And I, I, was, I go through, uh, my, my, when I decided to write a book, I really wanted to write a book about the future, but I also recognized if I wrote a book that didn't have something about you know, the growth of AOL and something particularly about the merger with Time Warner and some of the, the mistakes that were made, some of the lessons learned, people say, what's going on? You, know, we, we need to, you need to include it. And I also, after I thought more about it, concluded that some of those lessons actually could be applicable in the in the third wave. So it had helped as I thought about kind of defining this this is this the, the, the future. Uh, I frame in in that in that chapter how we were thinking about it and the alternatives we were we were looking at. And the setup on this is that when we went public in 1992, uh, it was the first internet company to go public. Uh, our market value that day was 70 million dollars and eight years later is $163 billion. And it was, as somebody in the introduction said, the best performing stock of the decade. So part of this was, hmm, you know, how do we diversify our mix of businesses and have a broader portfolio the best thing of, you, of, of business? Best deal that's ever been made in the history of deals, for you. <laughs> the other All side, right. less so. And your next question? No, and so that, that was part of the, on the financial side. The strategic side, we knew that you know, broadband was coming. We didn't own access to broadband. The government wasn't opening, requiring cable companies and broadband providers to do the same thing they did to phone companies, which was forcing them to open up their networks. So we were a little worried about our future. Time Warner had the largest cable, you know, kind of system footprint in the, in the country, and obviously tons of, of, of brands, CNN and Time Magazine and Warner Music and Warner Brothers, you know, HBO, et cetera, et cetera, that we thought would be valuable. And Time Warner recognized the, market was moving in a different direction, technology was moving in a direct, different direction, they didn't really have a path to a digital future, and therefore strategically it made sense. So the idea of the merger made sense, it was the execution of the idea that didn't make sense. In terms of your question, I lay out each of the options. We could have done nothing, 
we could have merged with other internet companies, and we were in discussions with eBay and Electronic Arts and others. We could have merged with a uh, communications company. We had discussions with AT&T. We could have merged with, with other content companies. We had discussions with, with, uh, with Disney. It's hard to say what would happen in the last 15 years because there's so many you know, factors uh, that, that, are, that are at play. Which of those, in retrospect, would have been better? I, I laid out what the, what, how we were thinking about eDopt. I can't, to this, you know, as you ask right now, say, that clearly was the, you know, was the better option. I think we actually picked the right option, but we didn't execute well against it, which is why I always summarize the merger uh, using a Thomas Edison quote, I think one of America's greatest inventors, which is vision without execution is hallucination. The idea was there, the vision was there, the execution was not, and as I say in, in, the, in, that, in that chapter, a lot of it was about people and, and culture right. and relationships, and, and, and it goes back to your questions on, on uh, on policy, that's part of what, you know, I think because I learned some of those lessons and, and it was a sort of a, what they say in the book, sort of a searing experience, it redoubled my commitment on some of these issues around policy to kind of figure out ways to kind of bring people together and understand that actually less about the ideas and more about getting people to believe in the ideas, champion the ideas, and rally around the ideas. So I don't know if you've read the headlines, but a decade later, or more than a decade later today, uh, Time is apparently in negotiations to buy Yahoo. If you were um, advising Time, your former, uh, one of your former companies, would you tell them this is a good or terrible idea? I would have to, uh, it kind of depends on, as you, as a deal guy, I would say like, what is the deal? I mean, there is, is there a strategic logic to having those uh, businesses together, yes. Is that the same? Is that the same as the AOL deal? Same with AOL, but it's 16 years later, and so the, and I think uh, there's much broader recognition around the you know what's possible in the in the in the future, and much broader recognition about the importance of technology. And lots, you know, there, there were some you know back then who actually didn't believe in the internet. They they thought it was you know just going to kind of be a flash in the pan you know kind of thing. So I think that dynamic is no longer. Uh, exists so it really then comes down to what's the deal and, and goes back to this people issue you know how is it going to be managed what are the priorities going to be how do you actually figure out a way to take the, that idea that vision and execute against that okay we got a couple more questions then we want to get to uh, these cards um, policy question it's in the news it's been in the news a lot recently and I think if you were still running AOL today you'd have to deal with it to some degree uh, which is this issue of encryption right um, Apple and the FBI battle Facebook just announced that WhatsApp um, is going to be encrypting end to end so that the police, the government can't get access to it ever. Is that the right policy? Is it the wrong policy? What, what, what should companies and how should the government and how should we think about this? It's really, really tricky. And I do not know the details. I've not been in the discussions. I don't know exactly what was going on with Apple and the FBI and exactly the details of, of I know in general what they're asked to do. I know in general what the concern uh, was about kind of creating a, a backdoor uh, that could result in other problems down the road. Uh, well, without having a little more understanding of specifics, it's hard, I think, to, or I think that's not wise to weigh in with an with a, with a opinion. The view of the technology world that privacy is paramount is, of course, true. And it uh, makes sense for Apple to basically be arguing on behalf of protecting people's privacy and ensuring the security of whatever software systems they have. At the same time, the view of the government that we are basically hired by the citizens to keep the country safe. And there are some times we need to figure out what what's happening to right. avoid bad things from happening is also true, which is why 50 years ago when this other newfangled technology emerged called the telephone, there was a big debate about it, including about you know, privacy, and ultimately said, you know, we're going to have to create this capability called wiretapping that basically allows the government with a court order and certain limited circumstances to actually listen in on the... So you're game for that? I, I, I lean on this side. But I think there needs to be a discussion about how do you enable these people to do their job and keep bad stuff from happening. And uh, But really most of the tech community is an absolutionist on this, right? And they believe ultimately that you, the second you make a backdoor of any sort, the encryption has, is completely a, it, it's a completely flawed proposition. I understand that argument. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to that argument. I'm also understand I'm sympathetic to the other argument. This is exactly my point. You do both this sides. This is exactly my point 
about the third wave and the need for this dialogue. Right. These are complicated issues. It doesn't lend itself to the 30 second talking points on cable news. It requires a deeper understanding of the issues and a constructive conversation about alternatives. I, you know, in the Apple case, obviously, there it kind of things kind of cool down when somebody other than Apple figured out a way to basically break that that phone. Uh, and you know, the, the you know the FBI was able. I don't know what the value of the information was, but they were able to you know kind of get into that phone. So sometimes there are other 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 uh, solutions. These are complicated issues, right. whether it be the issues of work or the issues of uh, of privacy or I mean, a lot of other issues that are going to surface in in the third wave. So part of my plea, it's why I called the book a little bit a memoir, uh, partly a playbook in terms of how innovators should think, whether they be entrepreneurs or larger companies. And partly a manifest, a little call to arms, a call for action. That you know, the the, the the government figure out a way to get their act together in terms of being more constructive and figuring out how to move stuff forward uh, across a lot of different issues. And a real plea for this side, the innovators, and this side, the policymakers, to talk to each other, not talk across each other. And, it, and so, yes, there there's this absolute view. There are many in Silicon Valley believe government has no purpose. It, it, you know, it should just, we right. should shut down the government, let technology solve all problems. I think that is naive and not constructive. There are also people in the government who want to basically control too much stuff and, 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 and basically think technology is a problem and, and kind of lurch the other way. The answer, of course, is somewhere in the middle. So how do we create a process to get to that, that middle ground sensible solution? Okay, we're going to go rapid fire. We have a handful of great questions from the audience. Here we go. Uh, do you still have an AOL address? I do. Okay. Um, that was easy. This is rapid fire. I tell you, rapid fire. This one's more substantive, but I'm going to have try to force you to do a quick answer. Looking back on your career, is there anything you would have done differently? Uh, I think probably the thing I, I talk about in the book. The thing I would have done differently is we did consider some other paths we did not take, including other acquisitions that we did not make. I, I, I note that. You know, at one point we were talking about should we buy Google when they were relatively small or Apple when they were still kind of struggling. In retrospect, those probably would have been pretty good choices. Right. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's sort of a little bit of the you know the, the thing we didn't do as opposed to the, the things that we we did do. I do talk about in terms of the the merge with this issue of execution. I thought the best thing to do would be because I was stepping down as CEO and 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 for the first couple of years being being the chair to not get involved day to day. In retrospect, that was a mistake. People thought I was sort of disengaged, almost arrogant, and if I'd spent more time building relationships with the different people in different divisions, I like to believe that might have led to a, a more constructive uh, solution. So there are some things that I certainly regret. And I think part of the reason I put those in the book, I think everybody learns from the, the mistakes more than right. they do from the successes. Question, what if you're not technical? How do you catch up and can you at all? Well, first of all, I'm not technical. You know, the, the, uh, you know, my first job out of college, not, 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 not particularly good at math, uh, not, not at all good at engineering. Uh, actually, not that good at many things. I just, but I, I'm pretty good at connecting the dots, I, I'm sort of getting a sense of kind of, you know, what's happening and sort of pattern recognition. So my first job was a marketing job at, at Procter & Gamble. My second job, I was in charge of new pizza development for Pizza Hut. <laughs> and I was paid to travel around the country and eat pizza. <laughs> that was my job. That was not a particularly technical job. Uh, and, and so I, I brought this more consumer marketing kind of sensibility to the internet, not tech. So I think, I think that, that's something, to answer the question, you, you can be an innovator without necessarily having you know, the skills to be an engineer. Indeed, the most important thing with the, these, the teams in the third wave is to have a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of viewpoints, and a diversity of skills in your team. So it really is a diverse you know, team. You ever Otherwise, you're did you ever want to be technical? And the, the reason I ask is, you know, if you really look at some of the most successful technology companies today, I'm thinking now of uh, Google and Facebook, for, for example, they really were led by people who were very technical, right. right? These were people who could code if they, if, if asked, and maybe not even asked, they well, actually the answer, liked to do it. The answer is no, and, and uh, partly because it wasn't a particular passion, was I don't think a particular, particular competency, but I also think what I was able to do without understanding those details is bring a perspective that was also necessary about how do you actually make this, in our case, they were all really easy to use. And, more affordable and more useful and more fun. So being a little disconnected from that, I think sometimes can be helpful. By the way, in the third wave, I think you'll see a different kind of entrepreneur and a different kind of CEO, and it will be less 
the 20 something dorm engineers and more people have some perspective on these, these industries, whether it be health or education right. or agriculture, what have you, and have a skill set around engaging with strategic partners, which is hard, and engaging with governments, which is hard and frustrating. So I wouldn't be surprised if the, the, it was a little bit different. And oh, by the way, that's what happened in the first wave. Right. It was a different kind of CEO, a different kind of uh, entrepreneur. Okay, this is a very fun and practical question. What are your current favorite apps? My current you're, favorite apps? Well, you're a guru. Yeah, we were talking guru. about this today. My, my current app of the moment is Facebook Live because it's part of this book tour. I've used it a bunch of times, including uh, basically much to the dismay of Andrew and his co-host on Squawk Boxes. Uh, well, they were, went live, I went live, and we had this dueling you know, camera thing. And then I did the same thing this afternoon at, at uh, CNN. And, and Facebook announced, a, Mark Zuckerberg today announced the expansion of that to create like a 24-hour network around uh, that. So that, that's it, the, uh, you know, my, my um, I guess my favorite of the moment. Twitter I'm, I'm pretty, pretty active on uh, as, as, as well. And I, I like everybody else, I, or most everybody else. I use uh, a lot of the other mapping things like right. Waze and Uber and other. other you apps don't have apps. a surprise app that we should know about? On Facebook Live, you didn't know about it till this morning. <laughs> Just trying to help you get into the future. It's okay. part of the third wave, Mr. Sorkin. Uh, security question. We've talked a little bit about security and encryption, but maybe this is a, a, a better and more general question. How vulnerable are we? Do you think to yourself that everything in your life on AOL.com and all of your email and everything ultimately one day is just going to be out there? You have to assume that. I, uh, a good friend of mine used to be at AOL, and, and now I work with him on the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian, is the CEO of, of Sony, Michael Linton. And mm -hmm. they, as everybody probably read now a year and a half ago or so, basically they were attacked. Uh, and their whole systems were brought down and all their emails from everybody in the company was released in the, in the public. So you have to assume that that's a possibility. I think companies now are trying to be smarter about managing that and governments are trying to be smarter about you know, managing that, but there's always gonna be that risk. Do you still get printed banking statements? I don't personally, but we, we get them in our, in our family office. That's how you would get them. Um, <laughs> Uh, related question, how do you expect the uh, Panama leak, the Panama paper leak, to affect American lives and businesses? Uh, well, I think it is another example, and there have been several, of the fact that one of the things that is empowering about the internet is the ability to quickly share information, and that does up the transparency of things, and. And, and if somebody is doing something they shouldn't do, the likelihood of somebody finding that out, like I saw today, the, I guess it was the prime minister in Iceland right. resigned because of some of the uh, disclosures. I think in general, that transparency is a good thing. It sometimes can be a bad thing because sometimes, you know, on, particularly going back to some of these tough issues, you need to figure out a way to have a you know, constructive dialogue. And sometimes it is getting people in a room. And if there's everything is being, you know, kind of uh, talked about in real time on Twitter or TV or what have you, sometimes it's harder to get people to, to find that, that, that common ground. But that is the reality that we, we live in. I should apologize on the last answer, by the way. I get my bank statements. The family office gets my bank statements, too. <laughs> um, uh, what do you think have been the three most important inventions of the last 50 years? I like this because they're, they're limiting you to only three. Um, 50 years, I'm not trying to remember exactly what the demarcation, I guess, that, uh, uh, which basically I'm 57 now, so it would be a pretty good uh, summary of my lifetime. I would say for me, uh, the internet would be number one, uh, and that's a, not just because I play a role in it, but I think that has been a game changer in terms of, uh, of empowering you know, people in ways that, that weren't possible before. I think in general, although I, I sometimes you know, think it's been unhelpful, as I said earlier, the, 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 the diffusion of, of, of knowledge outside the internet, including the, the fact that there's now far more things to watch on television, far more choices is a good thing. When I was growing up, there were three TV networks, and unless you owned a TV network or owned the printing press, you didn't really have a voice. I think having more voices there, the diversity of that's, uh, that's pretty important. Um, you know, those would be two that, that, that come to mind. What would you say is the third, Mr. Sorkin? Cell phone. Of course, of course, yeah. Cell phone is extremely 
empowering. And the combination of those things, uh, the internet, meeting the smartphone, uh, really has, has really powered right. the, 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 the I throw in GPS after that. I Which, by the way. a fundamental change. I don't ever look at a map again. Uh, GPS. I mean, again, I don't want to seem like I'm like the defender of government because I get I get frustrated as anybody about government. All funded by the government. All funded by the government. Right. GPS wouldn't you know didn't exist. Internet wouldn't exist. Weather data from NOAA that allows you to know like with these different dark sky and other apps like what, whether there's gonna be rain in the neighborhood you know in 15 minutes from now or an hour from now. All that was made possible by investments by the government. Okay, a couple more a couple more fun. These are really great questions. What is at the intersection of the third wave for our education system? And it's, I said we were going to drill down on a couple of different topics, and we, we, we got a little sidetracked. But on education specifically, how do you see it? I, I see it as being a huge opportunity. And I, I'm not a teacher, but I've talked to a lot of teachers, and I'm very respectful of the challenges of, of in the, in the teaching. Uh, but I've seen enough examples of this, and I've talked to enough teachers, that I do believe one of the real revolutions in, in the third wave will be in learning. And it won't just be learning in the cloud, you know, the, sort of the MOOCs or other ways, apps you can learn. It will also be better learning on the ground, in classrooms, whether it be you know, K-12 classrooms or, or colleges and, and universities. And there are, it's growing evidence uh, that, again, technology is not the answer to everything, but a lot of kids learn differently and we teach them the same right. way. And having more personalized, adaptive approaches to learning. Some people are more visual, some people just need more time. How do you use technology to do that? There are a bunch of, uh, of schools that are doing that. I think that will uh, expand. And universities, there's a lot of people who are now, or a lot of places that are now trying the idea of a flipped classroom where maybe you watch the video of that lecture be before you go to class and you have more interaction with the professor and other students doing that class. So it's, it's more interactive, less passive. My guess is that's going to end up being, being quite... Uh, Do you bend the cost curve at the same time in a meaningful way? It, you should be able to bend the cost curve in a meaningful right. way. And, and the other thing may be in the university sort of unbundling some things that are you know, right now are all you know, bundled together. So I think there'll be a lot of innovation here. It will be hard. Right. It will require partnerships. It, it doesn't have an involvement with the government and policy. So some people like, you know, you know, yeah, ooh, I don't want to do that. But you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that a, a generation of entrepreneurs, including some are these impact purpose driven entrepreneurs, will, will take that on. One place I saw this, it, it was remarkable, is New Orleans. That New Orleans, as everybody knows, was devastated by Katrina. It was terrible. They had to shut down all their schools. But in retrospect, in an odd way, it turned out to be a good thing because only 30% of their schools even had passing grades, and they created a new network, mostly charter schools, attracted a lot of people, including Teach for America people, to come there, and their schools are much better than they were 10 years ago. And dozens of educational technology ed tech startups now are flourishing right. in New Orleans, many by former teachers, because that's an environment that's more open to trying things because they had to restart. Uh, there's now more capital and talent focusing on it. So they're emerging. New Orleans is like one of the great ed tech cities, as much as New right. York or, or other places. This answer that you just provided may be the answer to this, but here it is. Uh, here's the question. All this new stuff is cool, and it's convenient, but does it really equal a better quality of life? Exactly my point. I think there are a lot of things uh, that are, have been convenient and a lot of things that are, make people's lives a little bit better because you can order that Uber or order that pizza or get those you know, kind of movie tickets more, uh, more conveniently. But a lot of the most fundamental aspects of people's lives haven't gotten the same level of innovation. That's uh, and that's what Third Wave is all about. Okay, two more, and then we'll let you out of here. Um, and I, I saved these for last because these are the ones I really love. So much of finding success um, is in an idea, a project, or a business. is about surrounding yourself with the right people. So what are the qualities in business partners or employees that you actually look for? Great question. And I, and I, I completely agree with it. it. It's sort of entrepreneurship is a team sport. It's not about the entrepreneur. It's about the team. So some of it is what is, when you hear an idea, you know, first, when I, when I hear a pitch, the first thing I go to is, is that interesting? Is that, am I, I'm kind of captivated by it. Is it something that actually could be important, could change the world? That's the starting point. The second is about people. And it's about the team. And do they have a certain understanding of that, a certain passion of that? Do they have a diversity around the team to understand how to you know, navigate uh, this world? And the third is some, uh, at least, beginnings of, right. of execution. So you, how do you actually take that idea and, and kind, of, you know, kind of make it happen? Do you have a go-to job interview question? No. This is not a question you like to ask? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but everybody knows I'm going to ask it. 
I, I, I have a mix of questions. Okay, final question. Uh, you've had a, a remarkable career as an entrepreneur. This book is about entrepreneurship. Are you born an entrepreneur or can you actually learn to be one? It's a, still a vigorous debate. I've talked to people on both sides of it. I, my view is most people I've encountered do have some natural tendency to think differently and as, as Steve Jobs said, and, and imagine you know, new possibilities uh, and be curious and, and not settle for the status quo. But I've absolutely run into people who didn't think they had it and suddenly when they're 40 or 50 or 60 years old, you know, kind of jumped into something and you not, would not have expected it. And I wouldn't be surprised if there were more of those in the third wave for the reason I mentioned, that having some expertise about that particular sector, that particular environment. It's hard if you're an engineer and you've never been in a classroom as a teacher to really understand the process right. of teaching, the culture of teaching. So I think having some experience, now I will acknowledge that there is a truism in uh, entrepreneurship that is mostly true, that the great entrepreneurs that tackle some of these uh, problems, because they don't fully understand that world, can look at it in new ways, ask questions in new ways, see insights in new ways. So in some ways, naivety is a competitive advantage right. for entrepreneurship. That actually is true, but it's gonna be also true and more true, I think, in the third wave, that having some understanding of what you're talking about and some credibility with constituencies, whether it be partners or policy or whatever, so you can take that idea and bring it forward also is important. I think that's gonna be one of the real tricks in this third wave. How do you balance that? And do you think you can do it more than once? Meaning, do you think that you can have more than one great idea? Sure. When you look at entrepreneurs for the most part, and Elon Musk and a, a very small handful of others, but for the most part, you have that one great success story, and that's the success story. Yeah, I think that's that. That I think statistically is true, but I don't think Elon Musk is the only example of, of serial entrepreneurs. In fact, we see a lot of people who who have had multiple companies and and have done something and want to do something else and you know, want to keep doing it, and it's almost like a. It's just, it's just, they're just how they're wired. And so the notion of, and it makes it easier for right. venture investors, serial entrepreneurs are easier to back because they know they've been through the battle and sometimes they fail, sometimes they succeeded, but they're, they're, that experience, that seasoning is, is very helpful. So I, I think there are people who have one idea and stick with it. I would also note there are people who have one idea and then morphed it. Google really was, when Larry and Sergey started, a search engine. Now Google, Alphabet, is that plus a bunch of other things, Android and cars and so forth. Jeff Bezos, when he started Amazon, really planned to just sell books. He sold books, then he started selling music, then he started selling other stuff, and then he you know, rated the you know, cloud AWS services, and now he's doing rockets and doing other, other kinds of things. So it, it's, I think you can expand your, 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 your perspective, and it's not just about you know, doing one thing and then you know, calling it a day. Steve Case, thank you for the conversation. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.